We are ready. Ready? Okay. Good. <coughs> well, I was born and raised in Laurel, Montana. And uh, this, by the way, is my 70th year of graduation from high school. So that's what you look forward to. <laughs> uh, born and raised in Laurel. It's a railroad town. If you've been to Laurel, you know that the railroad runs through the middle of town. When I was growing up, the south side of Laurel was called Germantown. And the way in which Germantown came about is that during that time period, from the 19, especially between 1920s and 1930s, uh, many of the uh, eastern part of Montana and Dakotas was hit with the drought. And many of those farmers that had immigrated from Germany into that area decided they couldn't make anything grow there. So they migrated into the Yellowstone Valley. And a substantial number of Germans established their area homes in and around Laurel. But in terms of residential area, almost all of that on the south side of the railroad track was German. Well, and you can visualize as World War II began, uh, people were very suspicious of these. Uh, many of them were immigrants, some of them were second generation. But there was a lot of suspicion about those Germans, much uh, concern that there was enemies in the middle of uh, in the middle of our town, and those people were treated with considerable discrimination. Uh, also, we had a number of Japanese families that lived in in the Laurel area, and uh, as you probably know, they set up internment camps. One of them in Cody, Wyoming. And one of my friends who was went through most of high school with me was a Japanese young man named Kei Picado. And he and his parents were sent, before he could graduate from high school, sent to Cody, Wyoming, because there was such suspicion of the Japanese. And I think that kind of discrimination, I, I hope, disappears from our country. And we certainly are in a situation where we have to be careful of it right now. So that's just a sideline story of, of my growing up. One of my, the person who was my locker person when I was in high school was a fellow by the name of Clarence. Clarence was from the south side of town. Well, it worked out fine. I got along with him really well. When he graduated from high school, he went into the service in June of 43, and six months later, he was killed in the South Pacific. So all kinds of things happened. Those Germans did serve in the service and with, with honor. So I, you can't look down on them. Okay. Tell them about her mother. Where did she live? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my mother also was a second generation German. She had graduated from the University of Nebraska and came to Laurel as a teacher. And as a first year teacher, she lived in a, in a family home in Laurel, but went to a German congregational church. And so for a while, she said she suffered with a little of that discrimination. Um, but everything worked out fine. Um, okay, as a couple of things that I would like to uh, talk about is some of the activities that I did in high school. And I want to pass around some of that information. Um, in the communication um, time, at that time, was, was quite interesting. My family was on a phone line with eight parties. And you didn't use the smartphone to connect. 
We crank the phone, and each of those eight people had a distinctive ring. It was either two shorts and a long, or a long and a short, or whatever the combination might be. And if you wanted to, you could listen in on what the rest of the people were doing and talking about. So, and somebody, sometimes, well, there would be one or two people that were always there. So you had to be careful. <laughs> always listening? Always listening. <laughs> the interesting thing is the phone number was quite simple, 162. I don't know how you remember those numbers, I don't know. But anyway, you dial up, tell the operator I, my phone number is 162. I want to talk to 457. So. Uh, when you look at the statistics about telephones during that time period in the 1940s, only 25% of the Montana people had telephones. Only 70% of the people in Montana had electricity. And only 30% had refrigerators that were electric. So, quite a different set of circumstances in terms of what the <coughs> what your daily accommodations were like. Do you know what the other seventy percent had for keeping their food cold? An ice box. Ice box. <laughs> How did they keep that going? Everybody ice. <laughs> the ice man came with a big chunk of ice, put it in every other day. Is it every other day? That's all. I think it would last. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, uh, growing up and going into high school, uh, we received all of the time current events on this kind of, of uh, news sheets. You had a radio in which probably about 70% of the people had radios, but this is the kind of thing that you would get in school. So I'll pass a few of these around. You can take a look at some of the kinds of things that, that uh, uh, each of the teachers would hand out and you'd have a test on what was what was there. Um, I think hairstyles and those kinds of things that were there are representative of quite a different era that we have now. Um, as I was growing up and in the high school, and the school newspaper. This is this happens to be the copy that came out right after um, December 7, 1941, and it's kind of representative of of the collection of school newspapers. What grade were you in in 1941? 1941 of the sophomore. So sophomore, the next year I started playing football. So there's a football picture. I'll pass that around shortly. Basketball was always fun and entertaining. Uh, this is a program that my dad picked up in February of 1942. So D-Day was in 41. Or, the uh, Japanese attack in 41. This was in February of 42, right after that. Uh, the kind of program that we put out at that time. And this is my, the publishing of yearbooks pretty much came to an end after 1941 because of the involvement of, the, of all of the things in, in uh, the war. 
So this is the last one that Laurel put out until after the war in 1946 when they started publishing again. Um, I'm a sophomore in this one. Okay, you want to talk about yours? Shall I? Okay. Um, I went to Missoula County High School. Is that our little emblem? I went to the GAA, Girls Athletic Association. Uh, I was a beginning freshman in 1941, and the day that, that, that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, we were at home, and my uncle and aunt and a couple cousins were there, and I had a girlfriend there, and we were in the bedroom studying. And my father came in, you've got to hear this, come quick. They were all sitting around the radio, very quietly listening, and that was the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Well, after the news broadcast, everybody sat in stunned silence. And then they started talking about World War I and the relatives who were in World War I and what happened to them. That started an era for most people that was much more uh, severe and business-like and yes, we had fun, but it wasn't nearly as much fun as if we would have been at peace. I can tell you one story about that particular time and it came out of this booklet. And this is a pretty good booklet to get if you are really interested in what was going on then. Well, anyhow, four days before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Burton K. Wheeler, senator from Montana, Republican, received a package in the mail. Incidentally, he was very pro-peace. He wanted us to stay out of the war. In that packet, he found uh, I'm looking for the name of it. Victory Program. Victory Program was put out by the U.S. Department of War. It was a top secret plan. President Roosevelt knew about it. And it was for the U.S. entry into the war. Well, this caught Burton K. Wheeler's attention because he didn't want us to go to war. So what can I do with this? He sent it to the newspaper. And President Roosevelt called him un-American and some other things that were worse because this was a secret document. Well, at that time, the Japanese Navy was headed for Pearl Harbor. So within four days, Burton K. Wheeler's news was old stuff. But it, it's an interesting little episode in the politics of our country. The Secretary of War was Henry Stimson at the time, and he was upset, very upset with that news leak. Because the U.S. had been making very quiet preparations from, the, from 1939 on to enter into the war, if necessary. Well, let's see. Okay, I was a freshman in in high school, 
and we had all kinds of activities that were curtailed. I got some stuff up here from the days when. And the, this is a kind of after the fact, but it was the first yearbook that was put out after the war. I remember she was from Sentinel High School, or from Hellgate High School. <coughs> yeah, yeah, Hellgate High School now. But at that time it was Missoula County High School. That, yeah, a name change. Okay, um, so what happened in Montana? Well, there were There were committees that had been organized previously that helped with the defense, defense plans of bridges and airfields and dams and refineries. Um, we knew that three blasts on the sirens and a blinking light meant air raids. We were warned that Japanese balloons might come over, and those balloons had incendiaries so that if they landed in our forests, they could start a fire. Um, citizens were trained as air raid wardens, uh, plane spotters, and some of the high school kids were really good for plane spotting. Draft boards were established. 1,600 men enlisted, including many of my classmates. So that's part of the reason why we didn't have football games. There wasn't enough people functioning, boys functioning to play football. But besides that, it was too expensive, and we weren't going to use the gas to go to the other towns in Montana. Uh, Okay, there was, there was uh, youth clubs that gathered scrap metal. And the first scrap metal drive was aluminum. And during that drive, they got over $9,000 worth of aluminum. And $9,000 in those days was a lot different than it is today. What do you think? $900,000? Well, not, it's pretty close though, not quite. But Anyhow, probably 10 times. this was something that went on throughout the war. The youth clubs would go and gather the scrap, and people would leave scrap on their porches or in the mailbox, no, not in the mailbox, beside the mailbox, um, for them to pick up and take. I helped roll bandages and wrap supplies for the Red Cross. That was something that they really needed too. But in the meantime, my life as a student proceeded and I liked to, to go to the gym after school and play ping pong, volleyball, badminton. Uh, and the studies kept me busy. This might be interesting to you. Some of the prices. Milk was 14 cents a quart. Eggs were 30 cents a dozen. Hamburger, 23 cents a pound. Campbell's soup, three cans for a quarter. You could have a Coke for five cents. First class postage was two cents, three cents. And if you've got one of those cards or envelopes with that stamp on it, don't take the stamp and tear it off, because the whole thing is valuable. Um, bus fare, seven cents. And we used the bus, and we used our feet, and we used bicycles. Firewood was 79 cents a load. 
or $79 a load, excuse me. And quite a few people used fire, fire. So there was some pollution around. The federal government finally put a price control on rent, clothing, and food, and there were shortages. Part of the shortages came from the fact that we were sending uh, things overseas. Factory production was going up for the war effort, and so the cars, and typewriters, and all these things that you think are essential went elsewhere. Uh, Nylons were replacing silk stockings. And you girls haven't lived till you have silk stockings. They were a pain. Uh, nylons are lovely, but they couldn't get them because the nylon material was going into parachutes and other things. So if you had one pair of nylons, you were very lucky. And if you got a run in it, you quick mended it. If you needed new overshoes, you had to turn in the old ones because that was rubber, and rubber was something that was hard to get here. Um, people walked to save their three gallons of, of gasoline a week. They got that was the ration for normal people. What they do with that ration? I'll find it. Anyhow. Um, there was a slogan, and I really like this slogan. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. And that was pretty much true. Okay. And we drove, tried to keep the driving speed down to 35 miles an hour. That's not just in town. That was 35 miles an hour on the highway to keep the use of gas down. I can tell you a story about uh, when I was about a sophomore, maybe, or junior. My dad had saved the gasoline just, we didn't use any gas for a while because my aunt in Whitefish had invited us to Thanksgiving dinner and the whole family was going to be there. Well, we in Missoula were probably the furthest, but he saved and, and we all knew what was going on. Everybody was very cooperative. And we made it to Whitefish. Well, the women were in the kitchen cooking the men were sitting in the front room board, and Dad had a new gun. He said, come on, let's go for a ride to the guys. And they went for a ride around Whitefish Lake. Pretty quick, they came back. And I had two uncles that were twins that were really jokers. And they came in, oh, Ruth, we got something for you in the trunk. Goody. <laughs> so I go out and open the trunk, and out rolls a bear. Well, that was a little bit of a scare to me, and the rest of the day I was disgusted with those two. But apparently they went around the lake, and my grandfather saw this bear up around the corner, and so it was his privilege to shoot the gun, which he had never shot before which really didn't matter because he was a dead eye. And uh, so down went the bear. And they said, where'd you shoot him? Behind the ear. Well, that's where it was shot. And apparently legally at that time, although I wouldn't swear to it, <laughs> but uh, for that bear, we used the meat put it with venison, and we called it bear-bocken. Uh, 
It wasn't bad. It was a little sweet. We used the fat, which we rendered out, and we got two meat points for each pound of fat. So that was important to us because we could get good meat from the grocery store that way. Okay. I can tell you the hunters were allocated 20 shells a piece. So you could go hunting, you could have 20 shells. My father's rule is, was if you go hunting, you get two shells. If you can't shoot the critter with two shells, he deserves to go free. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty good rule. Okay. Yellowstone Park officials had to shoot a lot of elk and bison that year because it had been so dry that there wasn't any forage. And so they did shoot quite a few animals that year just to supply what was left with something to eat. Then in Fort Missoula, that was a CCC camp. You know what CCC was? Civilian Conservation Yes. Yes. And <coughs> they had been in that camp at Fort Missoula, and it was unoccupied after uh, 1938, maybe. So. It was available when they needed it for internment, but the internees had to build barracks, and the big bar water fence that was around the place. They had to take care of their own garden so they would have food. And that was where I think the first internees went after 1939, and they were Italian. The Italian folks came from some ships that were docked in U.S. harbors that were taken by the U.S. Just said, now you live on your ships, and, and all the, the uh, Italian workers were allowed to live on their ships. But then after things got uh, a little more serious, then the word went out to take these ships over. And in the meantime, the Italian government had told the workers on the ships to scuttle them. So some of the ships were scuttled and some were taken over by the US. In the meantime, those Italian workers and some Italian workers that were in New York at the New York World's Fair, they didn't quite go home, but they were interned at that camp. And the people in Missoula didn't, I don't think they really minded the Italians. Uh, some of the Italians had passes to go up town and some of the Italians stayed after the war and had good restaurants. So there was some advantages there. Uh, then along came Japanese. And these were, I think, Japanese soldiers. It was not the same kind of internment camp that he talked about. Uh, but those Italians were happy to see them because they were good farmers. So. The Japanese uh, internees were taking over the farming effort, and uh, they managed okay. Then the last, the last ones to come were some Germans, and they were not allowed to go uptown. They weren't allowed to go outside the fence, and. I don't know that 
the Italian internees got along as well with them as they did with the Japanese, I won't say. Um, oh, let's see, what else? Were the Germans, were they sold, were they POWs or were they? Were they, uh, they were POWs, I think. Oh, okay. <coughs> yeah, because I don't think we had much else. Well, we had a few people that in the U.S. that were uh, German sympathizers that could have been in that group. Yeah. Or okay. Aliens. Uh, shortages. The shortages happened. A lot of them with the lend-lease program that happened before we got into the thick of it. Well, I guess after because. Land lease came after we got into the war. How many people were like interned near Missoula? In Missoula? Oh boy. I don't know. Just a rough And I don't think it's told me in this book. But this book has a pretty good section about it. Um, well, they had their own dining room, they had their own cooks. They had their own government system, and the Italians had this all set up when these other groups came into the fort. I don't know how much uh, that changed, or if it even changed. But after the war, these people were allowed to go home if they wanted to, and. Like I said, some of the Italian folks didn't want to. They wanted to stay. Um, when they um, were taken to the camps, like in Laurel, when they were put into the camps, did they get any compensation for their property that they owned? Or was it just for them? I'm sorry, I, don't, I have bad hearing, so we sure to speak up. Was when the um, like Japanese and Germans were taken to camps, um, like in Cody, were they given compensation for their um, private property, or did they get it back? No, they did not. <laughs> yeah. When they went in the internment camp, their property was confiscated. So that happened, I'm sure, in more places than just Montana, because I think their internment camp in Nevada, California especially, had internment camps. But no, they lost, they lost their property. Okay. Oh. I think Talk about the three pairs of shoes. Theory. Three pairs of shoes a year. Well, that's what we oh, did. Rationing. rationing. And I don't know where my rationing book went to. That's so. But I'm going to be in deep trouble if I've lost that. Because that was. <coughs> I was in high school when there was any compensation for the Japanese internees. Seriously. Yeah. I was in high school um, when that happened, so 1922. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <now. laughs> was it 84? 1984. When there, when when there was a, little, a tiny little bit of compensation, it wasn't until then, and an apology. But initially, oh, good, good. initially it was confiscated. Yeah, and then given to. Yeah. yeah. My pass out said I almost forgot. Well, she's putting that up. Talk a little bit about the cash and carry program that was started after about 1939. This was a very interesting scenario that happened in Montana. Um, Britain ordered, th this was before the United States got involved in, in, uh, in the European battle at all. 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and at that time, Britain had ordered about 400 trainer airplanes to be manufactured in the United States, but they were not allowed to have their pilots come in and fly the planes out of here and back to, uh, to England. 
So, rather a sneaky affair, the cash and carry program, Britain paid for them. They flew the planes to sweet grass, grass Montana, which is the border north of Great Falls. And they parked the planes next to the border, and the Canadian pilots threw ropes across the border. The Americans tied ropes to the planes. They pulled the planes across the border and then flew them in with Canadian pilots. And they did this with 400 planes. Now, that is the most unique situation I've ever heard of in my life. Is that, that isolationism of the United States at that time was so ingrained. We were not going to get involved in any way, shape, or form. Well, as you know, it wasn't very long after that until we got into the land lease program, and the land lease program got to be much more open about our supplying materials to, to uh, Britain especially, and um, the payment was, was on a lease basis type thing. So, quite a, quite a unique little time frame there with that cash and carry program. Um, let's see, <laughs> I forgot the next thing. Okay. But uh, what do you call the senior moments? What did you do in <laughs> high school? <laughs> Besides study. <laughs> well, some of that too. Uh, I was not a very good student, unfortunately. <laughs> the prospects were not great. I knew after uh, Pearl Harbor attack on that December 7th day, I was playing basketball with a friend outside of one of the neighbor's houses when I heard the news. And as a sophomore, I knew that it was only going to be a matter of time until I was going to be drafted. And uh, so going through school was pretty perfunctory. Um, during the time that I was in school, uh, the, when I was a junior, the next year, uh, this was the start of the war, I played football, so I ended up with uh, a, what it was then called the Class B District Championship. The state was divided into four districts, and Laurel won the Southern District in 1942. Uh, so that much was the end of my athletic career. Um, the year that I was a senior, I, uh, worked the last half of my senior year uh, as a uh, hostler helper on the railroad. I worked a night shift from uh, about 4 p.m. until midnight, go home, get up and go to school the next day, and go to work on the railroad. What was happening is all of the eligible men were getting into the service. They were either being drafted or they volunteered. So they were hiring high school students to do what amounted to menial jobs on the railroad and at 56 cents an hour. So that, I think, was a, a, an eye-opener for me to be working like that. As soon as I finished high school, I was called to the draft board and was drafted in uh, July of 1943. Uh, on this page is the commencement program for my graduation. And on the back side, my graduation picture of my gown. And then also my first part of my military career started at that point. Um, okay, I don't know if I, you're going to talk 
we're going to register it some more. Yeah. Let's see. There's, there's a page here that tells about, there it is, the points for popular size cans. When you went to buy canned food, you had to supply the stamps out of that little book that went around. Yeah, back there. And so you were careful about your stamps and about what books or uh, cans you picked. Well, his folks always got these letters from him. Oh, I'm just dying for some pineapple. This is what well, happened in the service. Yeah, in the service. And the pineapple wasn't produced in the U.S. It was produced in Hawaii and points, points further south. And so it was a very expensive little item to get. And so his folks would send him pineapple, 24 points, and that was their <coughs> points for one month. Can food. How many points would you get a month? You would get 24. Oh, Each person remember. got 24. I'm I'm pretty sure of this. Uh, so each person had one of those books with stamps in it. And you'll see it as it comes around. Did you see these? Yes, I did. I'll pass them over this way. Like, like every single person had them, or was it just yeah. like a certain age? It was even kids. Mm -hmm. And usually the mother took care of them. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, parents women's got place <laughs> was in the home until things got pretty tough. And then they found out women were good farmers. They could take care of the gas tanks. They could do all kinds of things. And that was kind of the beginning of liberation for the female part of the race. And I worked in the Missoula Mercantile, which is no more. It was the barn after it was the Mercantile. But anyhow, we got a little book of instructions how to behave as workers for the Mercantile. And I think maybe I got 25 cents an hour. I don't remember. I don't even remember going to a restaurant. <laughs> that was expensive. Oh dear, do you know? Uh, going to a restaurant, this didn't happen when I was growing up. I know, this didn't happen. Uh, just to tell you a little background story about food. Uh, my dad was a railroader, but he had an uh, uncle that had a small farm just north of Laurel. And he raised, some of what he raised was wheat. Every fall, my dad would go out and the uncle would give him 200 pounds of wheat. He would drive that wheat up to Boyd, Montana, which was somewhere near Red Lodge. And he would turn it into a flour mill up there. The guy would take 200 pounds of wheat, giving back 100 pounds of flour. And this is all the time, I would say, that I remember was from about 1937 on. Every year, that was what we did for getting flour. And we also uh, did things as eggs and milk. We often went to the local farmers and got them directly from them at a cheaper rate, obviously, than going to the store. So uh, this, it was relatively uh, important to go out and do your own search for some of your own food. 
Well, and you realize that everybody was in the in the garden business because you were trying to raise what you could. It didn't cost any points. And if you could go hunting, you went hunting. There was more more meat for the table, and it didn't cost any points. Uh, and how many points did you get for the fat again for the bear? You got points back. Two, cent, uh, two points per pound. So you'd save all your fat then. So you render it back. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know what that was for? It was used in making explosives. Let's read it. Well, God, that went fast, didn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you, and then you're coming back, I think. I don't know if you have any questions. Short period. No, that was great. That was really good. And, well, next week is... Do you have a, a question real fast before you go? Or, and they'll be back next week. Okay, yeah, we're coming back next week. We will. Yeah, we're coming back the week after.